Greetings, sisters and brothers. This is Milton Alimadi. Um, some of you may not know, but I am now in the graduate school doing my PhD in history at Howard University, the renowned Howard University in Washington, DC. A couple of you know that I've been teaching for a couple of years as adjunct professor at John Jay College, also taught for a few years at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University as a master's paper advisor. And I publish Black Star News as well, as you know. But I decided that I need to commit more time into history. So that is why I decided to pursue a PhD degree in history. And as a result of that, I've also decided that I should revive my African History Club conversation because I'm now going to be delving much more actively into the academic aspect, of course. And as always, I make it conversational, as I've been doing when I was posting on a more regular basis. So today, I want to... Um, talk a little bit about Thomas Sankara, because this week, October the 15th, a few days ago, today is the 20th, marks the 37th anniversary of the brutal assassination of Thomas Sankara by Blaise Compaoré, supposedly his best friend at the time, supposedly his deputy. But Compaoré, of course, was working on behalf of French imperialism and neoliberalism. And many of you know what that entails, where Africa's economy and Africa's politics is controlled essentially by the former colonial power, using its armed forces or using proxies on their behalf and using institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF. Why is Sankara's legacy so important and why is Sankara remembered so fondly today, 37 years after he was murdered? Sankara came to power in 1983. Ironically, <laughs> it was Blaise Compaoré himself who helped put him in power. Um, Sankara had been arrested. The French had already pointed out to the neo-colonial regime in what was an upper vault at the time that Sankara is danger. Because Sankara, they could detect how committed he was to the uplift of that former French colony. And through his statements, pronouncements, they could already detect that he was a very intelligent person who knew what needed to be done to get rid of neocolonial influence in Africa. So Blaise Campare and other officers released Sankara, they freed him, and he took over leadership. And in the four years that he was in power, from 1983 to 1987, tremendous transformation of Burkina Faso. Started off by changing the name of the country to Upper Volta, the colonial name, to Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso the land of the upright or the righteous people. There's a very good documentary by British filmmaker Robin Sheffield called Thomas Sankara, The Upright Man. If you haven't seen that, it's on YouTube. I strongly recommend you watch that documentary. And it elaborates on some of the points that I'm going to mention. So Sankara, what he was able to demonstrate was that power properly channeled and executed in an African country can transform that society. He was able to accomplish in four years what so many neocolonial rulers, appendages or puppets of imperialism have not been able to do in African countries. So for example, in Uganda, there's General Yoweri Museveni, an agent of imperialism, a puppet of imperialism, He's been there for 38 years, not been able to accomplish the things that Sankara was able to do in four years. 
Sankara empowered women, gave them meaningful positions in government and in the armed forces, recruiting them and had them trained in military techniques and tactics and actually made them part of the armed forces. And Sankara also said something very remarkable, which resonates today, or should resonate, and spread through most African countries. He said, a person trained in arms, given a uniform, without the correct ideological orientation, is basically a bandit. I'm paraphrasing him. And of course, those words have been proven many, many times in many African countries where the armed forces have been used as instruments of repression by autocratic rulers who maintain their power, not by the support of the population, by the armed forces and security forces, which to, are used to uh, suppress and repress the citizens. Sankara pointed that out. Sankara introduced land reform, gave ordinary people access to land that had been fenced off by these rural elite and urban elite who had land in the countryside, land they didn't even use. So by doing that, within three years, Burkina Faso became food self-sufficient. And that was a big thing for Sankara because one of the things he said was that, if you want the evidence of imperialism, all you have to look is look at your plate. If your food is important, how can you say you're an independent country? I'm going to outline a few of his other achievements, and then I'll close. In addition to some reminders of what ultimately happened to him, I'll talk about why imperialism saw the imperative need to remove him. Sankara saw desertification increasing in his country, Burkina Faso. So what did he do? He told the people that you can actually play an active role in stopping this. Taught people, with his associates of course, how to plant trees. They planted millions of trees and made an impact in slowing down desertification in Burkina Faso. Literacy, adult literacy was 23%. Sankara introduced universal literacy campaign and was able to uplift literacy standards in the entire country. Health was a big thing to Sankara. He introduced mass immunization of millions of people, of Bukinabe, as the people were then known, Bukinabe, and built clinics throughout the country. Sankara was able to abolish practices such as forced female circumcision, which is a practice in a number of African countries. He abolished that in Burkina Faso. He abolished forced marriages. So in other words, he was able to empower women and give them much more rights over the control of their bodies which of course, if you contrast with what is going on <laughs> in a place like the United States, where you had the uh, striking down of Roe v. Wade, and then you have the possibility of this uh, reactionary, clueless individual, dangerous individual uh, in the form of uh, Donald Trump. A in a close election, and possibly even being able to win. Think about that in 2024 in the United States. And look at what Thomas Sankara was doing, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of women's rights in the 1980s in Burkina Faso. Sankara introduced public housing projects in Burkina Faso, taught people how to build their own affordable homes launched a nationwide campaign to accomplish that in Sankara. So he met that task. Health, food, self-sufficiency, education through the literacy campaign, environmental policies when we have in the 21st century people in the industrialized countries 
still doubting whether there's anything like a climactic change and its adverse impacts on society today. <clears throat> so these were some of the accomplishments of Sankara. And then he wanted to set example that we don't recognize in elitism in this country. So he forbade the hanging of his portrait on, a wall, on the walls of offices and schools and other public buildings. He cut his own salary and that of his senior officials. He cut the practice of driving around in Mercedes vans in a country where most of the citizens were still impoverished. And his senior officials and ministers had to share small cars. But then he realized the most important thing was the economy and production. So he introduced new industries, for example, textiles. Why should we be importing, in addition to food, which of course they stop by becoming food self-sufficient, why are we importing clothes when we've been growing cotton for centuries? We know how to weave, we know how to produce textile, we know how to manufacture our clothes. So let's produce what we wear. And he practiced what he preached. He wore indigenous produced clothing. And that spurred an industry where thousands of farmers are now producing more cotton, thousands of women becoming involved in textiles production, and then, of course, uh, producing the uh, outfits that they wore. So the principal thing that Sankara wanted to accomplish was to end dependency, to show that formal independence in and of itself did not translate to actual sovereignty and independence. For that, you have to take control of your production. So he said, let's consume what we produce and let's produce what we consume. Sankara's message became very dangerous to neoliberalism and imperialism. Sankara did not believe in the heavy indebtedness that was weighing down African countries. So he refused to get any loans from the IMF and the World Bank. And this is ultimately what led to his downfall. At the Organization of African Meeting, Organization of African Unity Meeting, that's the organization that preceded what is now the African Union, the AU. At its annual meeting of the OAU in Addis Ababa, in July 1987. Sankara said this heavy indebtedness is holding us back as African countries, preventing us from developing. So let's renounce it, but let's do it collectively. If I do it alone, I will not be alive to attend next year's annual conference. That was July 1987. October 15, 1987, brutally murdered his body dismembered, buried in a mass graves with several of his compatriots who were killed alongside him by Blaise Campari, definitely under the influence of France, the former colonial power, and the French-controlled country, Ivory Coast, the neighboring country, which was governed by a reactionary leader at the time, Félix Jofé Boigny. Both had the influence over Blaise Campaure. And as a result, Thomas Sankara was brutally assassinated in the similar fashion in which Patrice Lumumba had been killed by imperialism, using African agents, of course, in 1960. And in that case, in the Congo, it was Mobutu. So Blaise Campaure acted out the same role of Mobutu then Mobutu had acted out in the Congo in 1960. He acted it out in Burkina Faso in 1987. And that was the end of that transformational government that Sankara had ushered into Burkina Faso, the kind of government that African countries actually need to transform their societies, to reject neocolonial 
rule in Africa, to reject the continued control of the economies. The Berlin Conference was held in 1884 from November to February 1885. The main, in addition to partitioning African countries amongst the European powers, the most enduring legacy is with the economic structure that was imposed. African countries essentially became large plantations producing raw materials that would be used into, in the factories in the European powers, in their countries, to produce manufacturers which were then sold back to this captive colonial market, sold back to Africans at an exorbitantly, exponentially much higher price. The products manufactured with the raw materials that they produced, sold back to them at exorbitant prices, whether it was agricultural production, manufacturing products, or whether they were increasingly later on um, uh, minerals uh, uh, and other natural resources. <clears throat> that structure was set up in 1884. That structure still applies today in 2024. There's not a single industrialized African country. And we know it can't be done. There's no magic formula behind it. China was able to do it by taking control of its sovereignty. So let me give you an example. In 1960, if you go back and you look at World Bank statistics, the per capita income of China was about $90 per head. Ghana's was almost 200 1960, that's not such a, a long time ago. Today, per capita income of Ghana, which is one of the better doing African countries, is under $3,000. And it's high by Africa standard. China's is more than five times that. And China, of course, is now a manufacturing power. Ironically, using Africa's raw materials <laughs> to power its own economy. Everybody in the rest of the world uses Africa's resources to uplift the standard of living of their people, except Africa. And that is what Sankara wanted to change in Burkina Faso when he said, let's produce what we consume and consume what we produce. Let's not be dependent on the foreign powers. Let's take control of our destiny. If African countries emulate the example that Thomas Sankara was setting in Burkina Faso, all of Africa would be able to be transformed in the next 10, 15, 20 years. That is why the legacy of Thomas Sankara remains very important today. There's a book, Thomas Sankara Speaks, which I highly recommend. It has many of his essays, so you can hear him speak for himself. And there are several other books that have been written about Thomas Sankara, but I primarily recommend where he speaks himself. So get Thomas Sankara Speaks, and also please watch that short documentary. It's only about 50 minutes or so by Robin Shuffle, Thomas Sankara, the Outright Man. May Thomas Sankara's legacy spread throughout Africa and other parts of the world. May he continue to rest in peace with the ancestors. That is my presentation for today. Thank you, sisters and brothers. Stay strong.